Joan Risch lived in Lincoln, Massachusetts with her husband, Martin, and their two children. She had the quintessential life of a suburban housewife after leaving her thriving career in the publishing industry to become a stay-at-home mom. The 31-year-old had a seemingly perfect marriage and doted on her son and daughter, but the Risch's lives were about to change for the worst. The morning of October 24th, 1961 began like any other. Martin left for a business trip. Joan had a cavity filled at the dentist and made another appointment for Halloween. Afterwards, she picked up a gift for her husband and returned home. While two-year-old David took a nap and four-year-old Lillian played outside with the neighbor's boy, Douglas Barker, Joan did chores. Then, around 2 p.m., Joan unexpectedly dropped Lillian and Douglas off at his house, saying she would be back. Douglas's mother, Barbara Barker, later saw Joan running towards her garage, carrying something red in her arms, but saw nothing further. Lillian returned home hours later and found what she described as red paint on the walls, but no trace of her mother. The red paint was blood, trailing throughout the house towards the garage where it stopped. The kitchen phone receiver was in the trash, the phone directory was open to the emergency numbers, and a bloody handprint stained the wall. Yet, young David was still asleep in his crib. Joan's car was parked in the driveway, but she was gone. Later, witnesses reported seeing a disoriented woman walking along Route 128. Despite the blood running down her legs, no one stopped to help her. Some believe this was the last true sighting of Joan Risch. Curiously, investigators found that Joan was fond of murder mysteries and thrillers and had checked out 25 such books the summer before her disappearance. Though her husband claimed Joan read these for pleasure, some believe she was learning how to stage her own disappearance, theorizing that she'd become unhappy with her role as a housewife. But theories about Joan's fate range from foul play to amnesia to a botched abortion. No suspects have ever been named, and she had no history of mental illness. It has been over 50 years since Joan's disappearance, and if she truly is alive, she would be 86 years old. Imagine the device in your hand being turned against you into a weapon used to stalk, harass, and terrorize you. In 2007, 16-year-old Courtney Kirkendall's phone used to be an escape, a private place to chat with friends through text to surf her social media sites in her own little corner of the internet. But it slowly became a source of constant dread, even when turned off. It began with the texts. Courtney's friends were receiving messages from her phone, but Courtney wasn't sending them. Then her family members began receiving multiple disturbing phone calls from a raspy male voice making threats, we hate you, we're going to cut your pet's throats, you're going to die, and we're going to murder you and your children. At first it seemed like the anonymous calls were the work of a prankster, anyone can call and make a threat, but then things got a little too personal. Seemingly empty threats distorted into, I know where you are, I know where you live, and the harasser unfortunately truly seemed to know every move the Kirkendalls made. He could tell the family members what clothing they were wearing, what they were doing, and when the children departed for school as well as where they attended school. The family listened to their voicemails only to hear their private conversations being played back at them. Conversations they'd had in the comfort of their own home. Feeling unsafe, they installed a security system at the house. Not long after, their stalker called and recited the passcode to disarm it. Finally, the Kirkendalls contacted the police. A look at the cell phone records sent a collective chill through the family. The harassing calls were being made from their own phones, with the majority of them coming from Courtney's. The only problem with that was the calls were made while the phones were turned off. That's when they began to notice their phones would turn on by themselves after being shut off and their ringtones had been changed. But it wasn't just the Kirkendalls who were terrorized. Courtney's aunt, Darcy Price, and the neighbor, Andrea McKay, became targets as well. Andrea, while cutting limes in her kitchen one day, picked up the ringing phone to a voice that simply said, I prefer lemons. The three families lived there every waking moment in fear. 
and authorities were just as disturbed by the activity. The Kirkendalls spoke with a detective and afterward received a call playing back their conversation, a warning that their stalker wasn't afraid of law enforcement. At the time, cell phone providers said they weren't aware of any technology that would allow such activity that the family had experienced. Furcrest Police Chief John Cheeseman, a longtime friend of the family, said he was dumbfounded and that his department had never seen anything like this before. Even after switching numbers and providers two times, the calls continued, pushing the constant weight of anxiety into the Kirkendall's everyday lives. Even with high-tech equipment meant to unweave the twisted hacker's web, police only ever found dead ends. The Kirkendall's treasure the days when their phones don't ring. Your attention, please. So big ups to our sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid has been one of the top RPG games for three years straight, and more content just keeps pouring in and nobody can stop it. Raid has legit hundreds of champions, my favorite aspect of the game. You all know I have love for the Shadowkin, badass warriors. Are they the good guys or the bad guys? I have no idea. And you know the Doom Tower is the place to hang. This game mode is 120 levels with wave after wave of terrifying bosses. And of course, big ups to the Hydra, the newest edition of Raid. The Hydra is probably the most frightening thing you'll see on your phone unless you're FaceTiming with my editor Scott's mom. And in true Hydra fashion, it has multiple heads, numerous deadly abilities, and regeneration to add to the challenge. So give in to peer pressure and click the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen to download it. In celebration of Raid's third anniversary, they're packing in even more content. This means free gifts for everyone, new events, new champs, new artifact sets, and even a fully personalized video showcasing every player's journey. Kind of like your parents' fridge when you were a kid, <laughs> unless you were me. If you use my link or scan the QR code, new players get a free starter pack valued at almost $40, loaded with free champions and 10 magic, 10 force, and 10 spirit XP brew. All new and existing players will get a smorgasbord of free birthday gifts well over $25. Launch the game and enter code 3 years raid to get your paws on everything. So thanks again to Raid and to all of you who try it out for supporting my channel. And now, back to the video. 33-year-old Terry Cottle, the husband of Cheryl Cottle, took his own life with a shotgun. His heart was donated to Sonny Graham, who only had six months to live due to congestive heart failure. In 1997, Sonny wrote to his donor's family, thanking them for the transplant that gave him a new life. He eventually met Cheryl, and they almost immediately fell in love. After marrying, Sonny and Cheryl moved to Vidalia, Georgia, after Sonny retired from his job as a communications manager at Hilton Head. The couple was extremely happy, but in 2008, unforeseen tragedy struck. Sonny went into the shed in his backyard, took a shotgun, placed the barrel up to his throat, and pulled the trigger, killing himself exactly as his heart donor had done before. Cheryl, widowed for a second time, was devastated. Some scientists believe the suicide was an instance of cellular memory, a phenomenon that occurs in a human subject after they receive surgical transplants. From what Sonny's relatives and family could observe, he did not seem to be struggling with depression whatsoever. Coincidence or not, the death of Sonny Graham is tragic, eerie, and not fully explained. Beneath the streets of Paris, France exist massive, complex tunnels of human remains. Known as the Catacombs of Paris, these underground ossuaries are the resting place for an estimated 6 million people. Between the late 18th and mid-19th centuries, remains were gradually transported into these catacombs after a number of above-ground cemeteries were shut down as they were deemed to be a risk to public health from cave-ins. Aside from that, graveyards were overflowing with burials. The Catacombs of Paris are actually a small part of a much larger network of abandoned mines below the city streets. For many years, these catacombs have been open to the public for guided tours, but not all areas of the catacombs can be explored. In fact, the official tours only offer exploration for a tiny portion of what the catacombs have to offer. Some portions of the catacombs are artistically structured with bones and skulls neatly placed and organized. Other areas, it appears as if bodies were hastily tossed into open areas to speed things along. Luckily for cataphiles, people who have a passion for exploring these more restricted areas of the catacombs, there isn't simply one entrance to the crypts below. 
Paris is littered with hidden secret entrances to access the tunnels without proper supervision so the explorer can wander about freely. This is a rather frequent occurrence and while it's not legal, the punishment is only a small fine, so many take the risk. However, these areas are illegal to explore for good reason. They're often composed of dangerously tight and at times unstable areas due to the sheer age of the structure. It's simple to become hopelessly stuck and crying for help will likely do nothing if help isn't already there with you. The possibility of adding to the remains of the catacombs yourself is an uncomfortably good one. In what was believed to have been the early 1990s, one man decided to infiltrate the pitch black, nearly soundless catacombs with a camcorder to explore. The camcorder was said to have been discovered some years after the man had entered the catacombs. The tape featured what is quite possibly the last record anyone has of the man's life. What comes next may disturb you. Venturing alone into the eerie labyrinth of millions of human remains, a labyrinth that is vast, confusing, easy to become lost inside, could either be considered brave or very foolish. The tape inside the camcorder was reviewed by a filmmaker named Francis Freeland, who claimed that the tape was given to him by the explorer who discovered it. The footage was featured on a television program called Scariest Places on Earth, which aired on Fox Family and later ABC Family from 2000 to 2006. It is unknown as to how much editing the footage was subjected to for its television premiere, but portions of the original footage had been cut out, with the more intense parts being featured on the program. Freeland, however, claims on the episode that there were over 40 minutes of video total before things took a bizarre turn and came to an abrupt end. The tape shows a point of view shot of a single man traveling through the shadowy, sometimes baffling tunnels. There isn't much question as to whether or not the man was actually there. His exploration shows very clear, factual footage of what can be found in the catacombs. The man stops a number of times to investigate bones, chambers filled with remains, and even goes as far as to pick up the cap of a skull. The man continues on finding arrows guiding his way. Whether these specific arrows point to an exit or only deeper is unknown, but what we do know is that the exploration didn't remain as calm as it had been for a portion of the footage. Eventually, the man encounters a rather chilling painting on a wall, a white human figure with its limbs spread apart. Shortly after this point, the explorer becomes rather uneasy. This discomfort quickly turns into panic, and he takes off running down a long, narrow pathway. Anyone could tell you that running in a panic through a vast, dark system of tombs is an awfully bad idea. It's a very real and fatal possibility to become quite lost. One more famous case tells the story of a doorkeeper for a hospital during the French Revolution who accessed the catacombs from a staircase located in the hospital courtyard. It's believed he swiftly became lost and his body was found 11 years later. The keys to the hospital still attached to his remains. Despite technological advances, the catacombs are as dangerous as ever. As the footage continues on, the explorer seems more and more disturbed as he races down the confined corridors, occasionally stopping to perhaps determine which way he should take. His breathing becomes louder and louder as panic and exhaustion take hold of him. And suddenly, without warning, the camcorder hits the ground as the man's feet rush over the wet dirt, carrying him off into the darkness. This is allegedly where the footage ends. The man does not return to the camera. It's simply left there until the battery dies. There is nothing more offered beyond this. The abrupt conclusion would point to the fact that the man filled with fear abandoned one of his lifelines, the light on his camera, finding a way out without it unless he had a very good idea of where he was and where the closest exit was is just about impossible. The episode of Scariest Places on Earth, which featured this found footage, aired in 2000. Since then, the mystery surrounding it has still gone unsolved. Those who have witnessed the footage, as you just have, still debate heavily over its authenticity. Though we can safely bet the location in the video is indeed the Paris Catacombs, and we know that becoming lost in the catacombs isn't difficult, we are left with many lingering questions. Is this found footage real, or is it a fake? Did the man die in those tunnels, or did he find a way out through the darkness? And most importantly, if the footage is real, what caused him to panic? Could it have been his imagination getting the best of him, or perhaps something more? 
No one has come forward with anything other than speculation, though it's quite possibly a hoax. Why has no one come forward? Even someone its creator might have shared the story with. These are questions we may never have answers to, but I welcome you to discuss your viewpoint in the comments below. <laughs> Expecting a baby should be one of the best moments in a mother's life. Just weeks before delivering her baby, Bobby Jo Stinnett was a dog breeder who frequently posted on message boards in order to sell her rat terrier puppies. Through the website, Bobby was introduced to Lisa Montgomery, who commonly went by her online persona, Darlene Fisher. It didn't take long before the two exchanged emails and developed a friendship. Lisa soon discovered that Bobby was expecting a child and was close to her due date. It was around this time when Lisa informed Bobby that she too was pregnant, something she ultimately lied about to gain her victim's trust. Lisa arranged to meet at Bobby's house, claiming to want to buy a rat terrier from the expecting mother. Upon meeting in person, Lisa made her way into the home quickly and began strangling Bobby with rope and immediately started cutting her belly open as she was unconscious, gruesomely tearing the premature baby out of Bobby. It was about an hour after the horrific assault when Bobby's mother discovered her daughter lying in a pool of her own blood. Bobby was pronounced dead when she arrived at the nearest hospital. Hours before Lisa's arrest, witnesses spotted Lisa in cafes, showing off the newborn with her husband to the public. Upon investigation, neuropsychologists discovered that Lisa suffered from severe pseudosiasis, a medical condition that causes a woman to falsely believe she is pregnant. In 2008, the jury involved in the trial recommended a death sentence after discovering that Lisa had planned the attack a while before initiating a meetup. The judge has since upheld the recommendation for Lisa Montgomery's death. Scafism, a Persian form of execution, or as their enemies like to call it, torturous death. For this method, the Persians were often referred to as barbarians. Scafism was seen as such a horrible way to die due to the fact that unlike beheading or hanging, it wasn't over very quickly at all. Scafism was achieved in one of two ways. It was often simply referred to as the boats, as two identical boats were used in the process. But also at times, a hollowed out tree would suffice as well. The poor soul sentenced to die would be forced either into the hollow between the two boats or into a hollowed out tree and forced to have their hands feet, and head sticking out. The Native Americans often used this tactic to execute people as well. However, this is where it ended. Leave the person out in the elements to die of exposure or starvation. The Persians went further though to ensure that the experience be that much more devastating. They would see to it that the victim was force-fed milk and honey in order to produce a bowel movement. If the person would refuse to eat, they would have their eyes pricked until the victim would forfeit their struggle. Milk and honey would be wiped onto the person's eyes, in their ears, and on genitals and exposed flesh, and they would be left within a putrid swamp to the nightmare that awaited them. Being overfed the way they were served two purposes. One was to prolong the victim's lifespan. And this was for a very specific reason, which ties into the second purpose, insects. The bowel movements would become so immense from the milk and honey that they would fill their improvised container with excrement. The sweetness of the honey plus the smell of feces would attract insects, which would begin by burrowing into exposed flesh and work their way inside the body, viciously gnawing at the eyes, ears, and other vital areas. The vermin would invade the victim's organs, carving pathways into the bowels and intestines where they would find new homes. It would be this way for days, weeks, until the victim finally were to succumb within a prison of festering, rotten excrement. One wouldn't even hear their own final thoughts over the buzzing, scratching, and chewing that droned from inside the wood. One particular victim was noted to have taken 17 days to fully die. On June 9, 1912, families gathered at the local Presbyterian Church in the small town of Villisca, Iowa, for a special service marking the end of Sunday school for the year. The Moors, a dedicated, well-respected Christian family in the community, were all in attendance, including parents Josiah and Sarah, as well as their four children, sons Herman, Paul, and Boyd, and their eldest child, Mary Catherine. But when the festivities ended, the Moore children weren't ready to let the day end, and begged 
their parents to let neighbors Lena and Ina Stillinger spend the night. Seeing no harm in it, Josiah and Sarah agreed and they walked back to their home with the six children, serving them cookies before tucking them into bed that night. However, no one could know that it would be their last meal, or that the dawn would bring about horrific bloodshed. An unknown assailant had broken into the house and hid in the attic, smoking and waiting patiently for the family's return. After everyone had fallen asleep, the intruder barged into the adult's room and hacked Josiah with an axe until he was unrecognizable, before beating Sarah and all six of the sleeping children with the blunt end, until the house fell silent again. But it wasn't just the gruesome discovery of the bodies the next morning that unnerved the police. The murder weapon was left behind in a bedroom next to a four pound cut of slab bacon and an unfinished meal sat next to a bowl of bloodied water on the dining table. The killer had also, before leaving, taken the time to rifle through the family's clothing and use various pieces to cover all of the mirrors in the house. As thousands gathered for the funeral procession, local police were still trying to track down the Moors and the Stillinger sisters' killer. But after crossing off name after name on a long list of suspects, everyone from a state senator to a traveling reverend, they still had no solid leads, and the case turned cold. To this day, the why and the who behind the Velisca Axe murders remain unsolved. In 1998, 19-year-old Tara Calico had a very tight schedule. On top of studying to become a psychologist, she held down a job at a local bank and liked to remain fit with activities such as tennis and bike riding. Tara took off for a bike ride on Highway 47, a short distance from her New Mexico home. Before she left, she asked her mother to come and get her if she wasn't back by noon, just in case she had managed to get a flat tire something she was familiar with in the past. Tara wasn't back by noon, so her mother promptly left to go and retrieve her. But Tara and the bicycle she was riding were both gone. Police discovered a cassette tape thought to have belonged to Tara in the dirt near where she was riding, with bike tracks nearby. Almost 20 miles further, they found a Sony Walkman that was believed to have also belonged to Tara. Her mother claimed she was sure that her daughter was leaving a trail for them to follow, but help was unable to do so. The case nearly went cold until a year later, when a photograph was discovered in a parking lot in Florida. The picture depicted what was widely believed to be Tara, alongside a young boy who resembled Michael Henley Jr., who also inexplicably went missing from New Mexico in the same year, but whose body was later found not far from where he disappeared. Beside Tara rested a book by V.C. Andrews, who friends of Tara claimed was her favorite author. Many years later, Tara's parents both ended up passing away, never knowing whatever happened to their daughter. Tips continue to come in over Tara's disappearance as authorities still, over a quarter of a century later, try to put the puzzle pieces together. Some deaths occur without rhyme or reason, and the evidence left behind will haunt us forever. Elisa Lamb was a 21-year-old student from Canada visiting Los Angeles, California in early 2013. Unfortunately, the hotel Elisa chose to stay at, the Hotel Cecil, was a place notorious for sinister happenings. A number of terrible things have occurred within its walls, from thefts to suicides to murders. The Hotel Cecil was perhaps best known for being the residence of two prolific serial killers, Jack Unterweger and Richard Ramirez, the infamous Night Stalker, who were responsible for striking immeasurable amounts of fear in their own respective ways through their brutal, merciless murders. One of the most haunting details of Elisa's final moments involved an elevator and were caught on security footage. Elisa can be seen stepping onto the elevator and pressing all of the buttons for an unknown reason. The elevator doors, however, refuse to close. Elisa cautiously steps to the elevator doors and darts her head out as if she were expecting someone to be out there, possibly even looking for her. Her movements are quick, like she doesn't wish to be caught. She ends up pressing herself into the corner of the elevator in what looks like an attempt to hide from an unseen presence. The elevator doors still malfunctioned and refused to close, so she stepped out from the elevator in a series of odd movements. Some time passes and she steps back into the elevator, appearing distressed, only to try again pressing all of the buttons. What happens next is most chilling, as the doors yet again refuse to close, 
and Elisa emerges into the hallway and begins moving in a disturbing manner. She moves out of the camera's view and doesn't return. 30 seconds later, the elevator doors finally close and it moves freely from floor to floor. Disturbing, yes, but it's not over yet. Two weeks later, residents of the Hotel Cecil complained to management that the water was discolored and that it smelled and tasted funny. When the water tanks on the roof were inspected to discover the cause, Elisa Lamb's body was found dead and bloated inside. It was determined that she had ended up inside the tank only moments after she stepped out of the elevator. The problem was that the roof was nearly impossible to access as it was blocked behind two locked, alarmed doors that Elisa somehow passed through undetected. Even if she had done it herself, Climbing the water tanks, opening one, and then closing it behind her would have been even more difficult. Despite this, investigators ruled her death accidental. Chilling, disturbing, and still not over yet. A movie named Dark Water depicts a mother and daughter who move into a slummy apartment where the water begins to run black. The daughter's name is Cecilia, close to Hotel Cecil, and the water's dark color is the result of a dead body up in the roof's water tank. At the end of the movie, the elevator even malfunctions. The movie was released eight years before Elisa Lamb's death. An eerie parallel indeed, however, still not over. An outbreak of tuberculosis erupted in the same location as where Elisa's body was found within the same time frame. The testing kit used for tuberculosis is known as the Lamb Elisa test. Elisa's first and last name switched, spelled exactly the same. Elisa's autopsy revealed that drugs played no role in her death. And though she did have bipolar disorder, her strange behavior and the details surrounding her death have yet to be explained. You see, death itself is nothing to be afraid of. But the manner in which death occurs, well... That's a different story altogether. Have you ever heard a suspicious sound coming from somewhere inside your house? Probably nothing, of course. Just your imagination getting the best of you. Unless it's not. Hinter Kaifeck was a small farmstead in 1920s Germany that housed an extended family. An older couple with their widowed daughter and her two young children, aged seven and two. The family also kept a maid in their employ until one day when the maid decided that it was time to go. She complained that the house was surely haunted and that she was very uncomfortable staying there. Not worth the money. So she packed up her things and quit, leaving the creepy farm behind. Truth be told, this decision was the best one she could have made. Though the family didn't exactly buy into anything paranormal happening with their farm, there were a few peculiar things that happened that the father made his neighbors aware of. He told them one winter, six months after their maid had left, that he had found a mysterious set of footprints out in the snow, leading from the darkened tree line towards his farm. The footprints only went one way and did not extend past his farm and did not return back to the trees. Unfortunately, he thought little of this. The family went on to experience strange noises coming from the attic, some of which sounded like footsteps. They found an odd newspaper that had no place being on their farm and their house keys went missing. None of this was reported to the police and the family continued on business as usual, which would turn into a very terrible decision. The family decided to hire a new maid. The woman arrived at the house just before nightfall. Such poor timing. That very night, only hours after the maid had arrived, the entire family, including the maid, were slaughtered. One by one, members of the family were led into the barn where they were chopped to death with a mattock. The father, mother, their daughter, and her daughter were all brutally murdered. Afterwards, the killer stalked inside the house and butchered the daughter's two-year-old son in his cot before moving into the maid's chamber 
and massacring her. The murders went unreported for some time as neighbors still saw smoke rising from their chimney. When neighbors notified police that no one from the family had been seen in days, they went to investigate and stumbled upon the gruesome scene. Whoever had murdered the inhabitants of Hinter Kaifek had remained on the property and was even sure to have fed the animals. Though there was a large amount of money and valuables in the home at the time of the murders, it was never touched. When they found the body of the seven-year-old daughter in the barn, they had determined she had remained alive for hours after the murder of her family and had witnessed it. For unknown reasons, she had ripped out clumps of her own hair before she died. The farm was torn down the following year in 1923, and to this day the case remains unsolved. The world is full of eerie mysteries, but don't you worry too much, it's very unlikely that you'll become part of one. But I suppose that's what all of these people thought as well. That's all for now. Remember, you may not believe it, but anything is possible in a world so seriously strange. Don't forget to subscribe, because you won't want to miss it.